Thank you so much, Alex. And uh, let me extend my congratulations again to our organizers for a really fantastic event. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I think this is an incredibly important topic, and I look forward to uh, seeing how our uh, collective research uh, might inform one another, because I think there's a lot of overlap. So I've actually changed the title of my talk. This is not as it's printed in your, uh, in your guide, because it seems to me that uh, as I was continuing to think, inspired even by some of the papers yesterday, continuing to think about the relationship between health, uh, that bodies and buildings, and uh, the collision between bodies and buildings really was a, cri a, a, a critical question. So uh, I've reframed my talk uh, just a little bit. In fact, I've done it twice over the last 48 hours. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so we'll see, we'll see what happens uh, today. Uh, it'll not be a surprise uh, to those who come from the world of architecture and architectural history that this image uh, plays a critical role in so much of the way that we think about this collision between architecture, design, and the human form. Uh, this, of course, is uh, uh, da Vinci's representation of an ancient uh, Roman uh, imaginary of the body uh, by Vitruvius, uh, a visioning of the relationship between geometry and the human form. Uh, it is laid out as a critical formula uh, to better understand the d divine inspiration of the human form and the correlation between that divine inspiration and questions of proportion, order, symmetry, proportionality. And so this correlation in the mind of um, uh, designers for uh, so long has in many ways kind of aligned specifically with the human body and the relationship between the human body as a mechanism by which we can imagine and understand uh, perfect proportion. Uh, the question of proportionality and geometry is something that played a critical role, obviously, also in uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, vision for uh, the academical village, as Richard Wilson has so beautifully set me up, and that's not, not by accident. We asked him to go first because <laughs> I really needed him to do what he did before I could do what I did, uh, what I'm doing. But uh, Jefferson's um, uh, understanding of the importance of proportion, he'd read Palladio uh, time and time and time again, multiple versions of it, understood some of the core principles of Vitruvius, and that's realized for us in these two drawings, uh, the one on the left here of the library, which we now call the Rotunda, uh, obviously modeled on the Pantheon. You can see uh, stippled, stippled in the inscription of the perfect circle in and around the design. It's a little clearer even in the section of the Rotunda functioning as the library, which you can see he's inscribed there the circle as well. So the correlation here is not one that is accidental. Uh, there is a vision for the ideal man, ideal proportions, and uh, the sort of geometric perfection uh, in design. And so uh, this view, uh, which was completed of the academical village soon after, um, or actually uh, soon after Jefferson um, uh, passes, but before the university is even uh, fully complete, uh, in many ways really does represent the academical village as it was imagined in a kind of perfected state this vision of a, a, a realized design, and in many ways it might even be appropriate for us to imagine uh, the Vitruvian man there at the fore, at the head, if you will, of this entire complex. But I want to shift our conversation from the ideal to the real. When we talk about bodies, we often talk about idealized bodies, perfected bodies, and architectural design has perpetuated or uh, persisted uh, that particular framework. I'd like to shift our framework from ideal bodies actually to real bodies, and real bodies at the academical village in three chapters. The first chapter is feeding bodies. Feeding bodies. These are two of the ten designs for the pavilions that Thomas Jefferson executes over the course of the construction of the academical village. On the left, you'll see the very first design. This is for pavilion seven. Uh, and in it, he sets, a, sets up a typology for all ten, all ten of these designs. But here you can see the elevation. This is not entirely different from the ones that uh, Professor Wilson was showing just a few minutes ago. The elevation of the building as it would be seen from the lawn. Uh, the ground floor here, of course, uh, would, is intended to be the classroom and the professor's apartment upstairs. That's realized here in these two critical elevations. There's the door directly into the large uh, classroom space that would dominate the ground floor uh, of the pavilion. 
and then the side staircase here, there's the door to the side staircase, would lead up to the professor's apartment. But it's important for us to realize that even though from the academical village's perspective, from the lawn's side, the pavilion is a two-story building, by the time that Jefferson is actually building the academical village, uh, the reality of the site, as Professor Wilson has already suggested, became a problem. Uh, because you can, you're not just reading books at the academical village, you also have to eat. Right? There's just the reality that this place is going to be filled with human bodies that have human processes. How are you actually going to support that? So Jefferson realizes the, uh, uh, um, the essential necessity of installing the third floor. Right? So we have the, cl the classroom space, which is the, the ground floor, the upper story, which is the faculty member's apartment, but then, of course, he also includes a subterranean space, that is the cellar, the basement. What does he include in there? This is the staircase down into the space. This large building, uh, this large room across the back, uh, dominated by a fireplace here, of course, is the cooking kitchen, the necessity to provide meals for the occupants of the building. Uh, but what do you notice? I'm actually going to uh, quickly move to a dialogic. What, what do you notice about this particular cellar space? If that's a cooking kitchen, what's missing? A sink? Sure. <laughs> You've got a fireplace, but what else is not there? You've got it. Something that lets well. So there's a chimney, right? So the spoke does go up to the chimney. Imagine yourself being a cook in that space. There's no windows. There's not a single window. Jefferson has provided absolutely no natural light whatsoever for this poor cook who has to produce meals in this space. These are, these are fully subterranean with no light whatsoever, probably some kind of a pantry space. But this, uh, the inaugural kitchen at the Academical Village, not a great success, right? So Jefferson then moves to building his, this is the second uh, building that he designs, the second of the pavilions, which is now Pavilion 3. Uh, the ground floor space here, which is the, uh, the uh, part, sorry, the, the classroom space, the upstairs apartment, and he, of course, he has a flap here with, as he's changing his mind, changing his design, he adds these flaps to it. Uh, but then here we have the cellar. That same staircase goes down. Same staircase goes down. He's moved the cooking fireplace now against the inner wall, which provides both a door and two windows. So it is my supposition that someone who was cooking in this fireplace gave Jefferson a little piece of her mind. Um, and then uh, when, uh, when it came to designing the second of the 10 uh, kitchens at the Academical Village, and then, of course, there's this huge space that Jefferson would later call, actually one of the occupants would later call a servant's hall. And so that would be the accommodation space for all the enslaved African Americans that functioned uh, and labored in these spaces. One of the great joys I have is uh, because the University of Virginia in Special Collections has all 10 of these drawings, when I'm often working with students, I'll ask Special Collections to pull all 10 out. We'll put them in numerical order, and students won't, there's not a whole lot, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But as soon as you put them in chronological order, you can actually see Jefferson's mind uh, evolving over time as he is experimenting with all 10 designs and put them in. And so I won't walk through the, all of them, but here's the cellar space uh, in this uh, identical design actually for pavilions one and five. And then by the time you get here, there's the cooking kitchen in the cellar, lots of windows, and these windows are south and west facing, a cooking fireplace here, two subterranean pantries, circulation space, and then actually a private chamber for the cook. By the time she, he gets over to the west side of the lawn, the cook actually has her own private residential space, which is really sort of remarkable. One of the great things that we've been trying to do over the last five years is actually now begin to think about the occupants of the academical village as a lived experience. And so here we have, this is uh, a Professor Bladerman, who's one of the first modern languages professors. Uh, here's his apartment. There's his classroom space. But when you actually take a photograph from the back side of the building, you can see that it also has that cellar floor. So the service spaces of this pavilion are now fully realized. Here's the floor plan in Jefferson's design. And so these three windows are these three windows. These two windows here uh, illuminate this grounds, uh, this cellar space, which I suspect to be the cook's room. That window right there, which is this window right here, illumines the long, narrow kitchen. And we also know through the historical record that this long, narrow kitchen, in fact, was first occupied by a woman named Lucy Cottrell, and you see her photograph. She's one of the very few enslaved African Americans at the University of Virginia for whom we actually have a photograph from the 1850s. Here she is holding uh, one of the Bladerman children. So Lucy Cottrell, um, who was purchased by George Bladerman from the Thomas Jefferson estate at Monticello when the, uh, the state sale happens at the 
uh, immediately after his death, she's purchased, and this is actually her cooking kitchen. So not only do we have the opportunity here to begin to recover the whole landscape of service of the academical village and how did food and the provision of food actually operate, we're now beginning to people that space as well. Uh, and the, uh, the Lucy Cottrell story is a really important, uh, interesting survival. Uh, the United States, um, from, the, from the very late 18th century, actually inaugurates a decennial census, which means that a census taker runs through every 10 years and literally records all of the various individuals that in any location. And so overlaid here on an 1850, uh, 1858 map of the academical village, what we've laid in is the census account uh, for the population in 1830. And you can see that, he, well, besides this one for whom which for some reason we have no uh, accounting there, but you can actually see each of the 10 pavilions, five on each side, we have the recorded occupants of those pavilions, and we start to see some striking numbers. Uh, this pavilion is sort of what we expected when we first saw that, four white op occupants, four enslaved African American occupants here, four and five. That's the uh, standard domestic support staff that one would expect for an antebellum uh, plantation house of the same period. But there are a few others where there's, uh, there must be extended property uh, this particular professor, white, five white uh, residents, 18 enslaved African Americans. Probably not all resident in that one uh, pavilion. This person uh, likely has parcels of land uh, uh, outside uh, the academical village. And so 10 pavilions with those uh, enslaved occupants begin to help us better understand who is the labor force that's beginning to provide all of the food that's necessary to support the 150 uh, students that are living in this place at any one point in time in the early, 18, in the early 19th century, together with the faculty members and their, uh, and their uh, families. This is a really important plat uh, of the academical village and its immediate environs in 1858. And this plat shows here, once again, right, there's the rotunda, there's the, fi the five pavilions on each side, the ranges, which I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, but then all of the land immediately beyond that. And if we move into a detail, you can see that there, the, the landscape is actually parceled out in a way that better supports the processing and the provision of food that's so necessary for the running of these spaces. So how are we feeding all of these bodies? Where is that food coming from? This plat parcels out that the, each of the 10 pavilions, each of those fi, uh, five on each side, each of the 10 pavilions, is allocated a four acre and a quarter parcel for uh, uh, either for grassland, for pasture, or for an expansive uh, garden space beyond. And so a uh, larger parcel here, and then kitchen gardens, um, the 10 professors' gardens. And so here we have one acre parcels that are dedicated specifically to the growing of fruits and vegetables uh, for the uh, sustaining of the house. And so each one of these pavilions has two parcels, a larger parcel and a smaller parcel. And for those of you that are more familiar with uh, Charlottesville and the University of Virginia, you'll know that these are basically, this is the volleyball court, all, uh, the memorial gym is up here. This is Brown College and moving on to the uh, chemistry and the physics buildings uh, are all up on, on this side off of McCormick Road. So there's actually a subdivision of the landscape that is absolutely required uh, as a way of providing food uh, to, uh, to run the three meals a day that are necessitated uh, by, uh, um, that are necessitated for the support of each one of these pavilions. Uh, but it's not just those. There's actually a third and maybe even a fourth set of spaces that are associated. In addition to the four acre lot, the one acre kitchen parcels, each of the pavilions also has a yard, uh, sorry, garden behind it and a, an adjacent work yard. So you can see that these curvilinear walls right here are the alleyway for students who are living back here to come up to their classes, and for students that are living up here to come back to their, um, uh, essentially their cafeteria, their dining, their dining halls. Dining facilities are back here, classroom spaces are here. And so these curvilinear walls bound out the alleys of movement for the white occupants of the landscape between those two particular zones. The space in between is subdivided uh, into gardens here and then workyards immediately adjacent. Let's take a look at how those spaces functioned. As they're represented today, they reflect, of course, the colonial revival gardens that were installed in the 1940s. So today, these are really spectacular spaces filled with azaleas and tulips and beautiful things, especially in the spring, really spectacular gardens. That, of course, is not at all what would have been there in the early 19th century. 
Um, when we look at uh, 1850s views, such as this one by uh, uh, Cassius Bond, uh, you'll actually begin to see, you can see the curvilinear walls right here, right? So this is an aerial view of those spaces. I'll zoom in, get a little bit of a better detail. There's the curvilinear walls. This is the alley space that is the thoroughfare for the white students moving back and forth. And all of the spaces between now uh, parceled out with, um, now parceled out with trees reflect the growing up of little buildings, whole series of little buildings that are in all of these spaces. What had been, uh, what are now represented as really spectacular 1940s gardens uh, were actually were workyards. They were workspaces filled with uh, smoke houses and dairies and uh, quartering spaces for uh, the overflow of the enslaved population. We're, of course, not going to pull out all of those uh, gardens. Those gardens are the now themselves over 50 years old. They're part of the historical record and the historical layer of the academical village. So as a way of better understanding how those gardens and those workspaces actually functioned over the last five years, and this is special thanks to Lauren Massari, who's been the genius behind the production of this digital model, uh, we've been working on the uh, construction of a digital model that allow us to unfold the academical village in 1830, 1840, 1850, and 1860 to better understand how the workspaces and the support spaces uh, survived. Because while Thomas Jefferson's vision for the pavilions and the range are all, all remain largely intact, the ephemeral landscape of service and support um, the, the landscape of slavery has largely been lost. And so this model is an opportunity for us to recreate, reconstitute the way that, lang uh, that landscape actually functioned. Um, the model is inspired by a variety of different uh, digital uh, techniques. Some of these are, some of the buildings are built just wholly uh, digitally. Some of them are a result of data scan, uh, a cloud point uh, data collection. That's particularly true of the uh, Corinthian capitals, because if you've ever had to produce a Corinthian capital in a digital model, it's nearly impossible. So cloud point scanning is a result there. Uh, but this, uh, this model is accurate, take a breath, to the inch. Accurate to the inch. Um, and it's not yet complete. You can see here these gray boxes are buildings that we've not yet gotten to. And so uh, it's, it's still a project uh, in, uh, in under production. So this is a view of the back of Pavilion uh, 2, uh, no, sorry, 4, uh, the back side of Pavilion 4 uh, that, sorry, this is 6. Yeah, it is 6. I was just going to say, no, 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 actually it's 6. This is the back side of Pavilion 6. We have a bit of data from Pavilion 4. We have a lot of data for the workyard of Pavilion 6 because Pavilion 6 is one of the few spaces that's been pretty extensively uh, excavated archaeologically. And so this digital model was as a result of early photography, any early surviving photography, written accounts, archaeological accounts as well. And so we're taking a variety of uh, bits of data to try to recover. Uh, so what this means is that we're beginning to be able to see how these antebellum workspaces uh, actually function with buildings that are no longer there, fences that subdivided the space to cordon off uh, white, um, uh, white individuals who are moving around the space from the enslaved African Americans that are laboring in those spaces. Uh, and it allows us to position uh, the sort of ephemera of uh, work objects, uh, so laundry that's happening out in the yard, piles of wood that are there, uh, where we are able to identify chicken coops. We know that there are cows being housed here, and we'll talk about pigs in a few minutes. Uh, privies, and so all of the various uh, necessities for everyday life are now, uh, we're able to reinstall those into the, into the landscape. And one of the things that we haven't done here yet um, is the installation of the fruit, uh, the fruit trees. We know that there's a, numer uh, there's a wide range of fruit trees that are part of these gardens, and that has a profound impact on visibility. And so one of the other things that this model allows us to do is to better understand who can see who working in these spaces in the 19th century, because we know from the written record and from the historical record that surveillance, white surveillance of working black bodies is a really critical model, a, a tool for, uh, for control of the enslaved population uh, that labors here. And so in addition to Lucy Cottrell uh, and her subterranean kitchen, we now also know that some of those, those subterranean kitchens were dank, they were uh, very difficult to cook in, they were dark, and so many of those subterranean kitchens after Jefferson uh, dies are replaced by uh, additional kitchens, kitchens that are out in the workyard, uh, and this is, one of, this is the kitchen that no longer survives, but we have quite a bit of data archaeologically as well as 
um, uh, from the documentary record, uh, the kitchen that stands behind Pavilion 6, and we know that Pavilion 6's kitchen um, was the place of labor for Isabella Gibbons, and this is the second photo, one of the few other photographs we have of an enslaved person. This is after emancipation, when Isabella Gibbons is one of the lead uh, educators at the African American school in Charlottesville called the Jefferson School. So she, having learned how to read and write at the academical village, uh, at the moment of emancipation, she leaves and founds a school uh, for the black students in Charlottesville, and she's one of those lead teachers. She um, uh, was born, not born, she was raised and worked uh, here in this particular kitchen, in this kitchen yard. So I mentioned that there were really two zones. The pavilions are one of the central spaces of, uh, of enslaved labor uh, for food production. If you're going to feed bodies, how do you do that? Uh, the second, of course, are these, uh, the ranges at the backsides. And you can see the, the data here from four of, the, uh, four of the six of what were referred to as the hotels. So if the pavilions were the residents of the faculty, the hotels were the res residences of the hotel keepers. And the hotel keepers leased out that space as a way of providing food uh, three meals a day uh, for, the, uh, for the student population. Every student at the University of Virginia was a um, assignee or a leasee of one of the spaces in, uh, a resident really of one of these hotels. How did the hotels function? I mean, actually you can see, let's just take just a quick look. So uh, 12 white occupants in this, 28 enslaved African Americans, right? 11, 13. Six and 16, and this is only in 1830, and so th these other hotels are not yet up and operational because there's not enough demand, because there's only 120 students. Uh, but, but by the time we get to the 1850s, there are 600 students in residence. All six hotels are fully up and operational, and even that's not providing enough food uh, for the students, and so students are, uh, ha uh, 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 are uh, eating elsewhere. So how did a hotel operate? Uh, the hotels are only two stories, unlike the pavilions, which are three stories. Uh, and this is the digital uh, view of the hotel, um, of Hotel A. Uh, the main residence floor here would be the dining spaces, and then uh, the spaces down below is where the, um, uh, the, the huge numbers of enslaved occupants are actually providing three meals a day. And we have quite a bit of information about how food functioning uh, happens in these hotels because uh, Jefferson Wright wrote out and, um, uh, a series of what were called enactments. The enactments were... Um, uh, the sort of regulations and requirements for, uh, for how food was produced. And so we know that the main meal, which is uh, uh, supper in the middle of the day, um, was uh, required four vegetables and three meats at every sitting. Uh, warm biscuits and uh, warm bread was provided for every breakfast. And so these rules and regulations help us better understand um, how that how that functioned. And what we're trying to do now uh, is use that historical evidence to better understand how that actually happened in the physical spaces uh, that uh, survived for us. So if feeding bodies is uh, one of the most uh, important of the dimensions, uh, exercising bodies is a second. And so just a brief moment here on gymnasia. We know that uh, Jefferson, of course, uh, builds the uh, rotunda here as the uh, library, but immediately adjacent are these two little spans, which were called the East and the West Gymnasia. Uh, and you can see them from, the, from our reconstruction here, the East and the West Gymnasia. We don't know a whole lot about the gymnasia and how they actually functioned, uh, but we, knew, we do know that they were abandoned fairly quickly. Oh, so I'm so sorry, this is too dark, but uh, this is an interior view the, uh, from the reconstruction, because it's now filled with classroom spaces, of course. Uh, but the gymnasia spaces, they were fairly broad and long, but they were too, the, they were too short, right? The ceiling height was really too... Um, uh, it only allowed you to uh, move your body back and forth. You can't throw a ball, you can't do much gymnastics, and so uh, it was fairly limited. We know that this is a space that was used uh, for fencing. A fencing master uh, operates a fencing school here for a while, uh, but then fairly quickly after that, uh, a second gymnasium, a round gymnasium, uh, is built by the 1850s at the foot of the academical village, and here in this bond view from the early 1850s, you can see a series of students doing gymnastics in and around all kinds of um, uh, suspension bars and other things that are around for the manipulation of the body. So if feeding the body is one thing, exercising the body is the second, dissecting the body becomes the third. And so our final chapter will look at what happens when uh, um, in medical school education when you actually are then uh, needing to dissect the corpse. Jefferson's final design here for the, uh, for the anatomical theater, um, and we know that the anatomic, we know exactly where it stood, and it stood uh, well into the era of photography. It's the only Jefferson-era building that was uh, um, 
demolished. It's been demolished, uh, so it no longer survives for us. It's where, uh, for those of you from the University of Virginia, it's located sort of where the, the Berlin Wall now stands uh, in that uh, additional space just beyond uh, the, the, uh, the academical village. And so here it is, is the academical village, in, sorry, the an anatomical theater uh, in our digital visualization. And if I can just for a moment, if it'll let me, I have a, there we are. This is a, a visualization that was actually produced by my son. Um, uh, so I absolutely wanted to show it. Of the anatomical theater, which evolves over time uh, and its proximity to the, uh, to the rest of the academical village. And that's enough of that. Moving on, we also have a digital reconstruction of the interior. And as we um, uh, experienced the anatomical theater at the University of Padova, I was astonished at how narrow and tall and steep it was. It was really, having seen this visualization, I was expecting something that was much airier. But the tightness of the anatomical theater was far more functional, because what it meant is that you could actually have lots and lots of faces and heads right over the body. Jefferson, um, when he designed this one, designed something that's much more open, but it's also quite a, uh, quite a bit further uh, to actually see the dissected body, and the students aren't quite as elevated. And so because we have this section, we're able to uh, uh, produce this um, uh, digital visualization of a building now gone. Uh, we have come to realize that dissections actually only happen in this building for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, after about 15 years, dissection moves out of the anatomical theater, which is positioned right here, into what's called a dissecting room. And you can see that dissecting room right here. Uh, this would eventually become, by the late 19th century, colloquially called Stiff Hall. Um, but the building in which the dissections actually take place and the numbers of students are, are far fewer and so dissections are happening right on top of the table with students standing around. Here's an early 20th century photograph of Stiff, Stiff Hall. Uh, it's also interesting that Stiff Hall is immediately proximate to the reservoir, right? So this is a stream that runs through. There's a dam. Uh, I guess the dam's actually there. Of the no, I guess the dam's there. Of uh, the reservoir. So the uh, dissections have moved away from the anatomical theater into Stiff Hall, and that Stiff Hall is immediately adjacent to the reservoir. Why would they need a reservoir? For the submersion of bodies, for, for their preservation, right? And so uh, in seasons when, particularly when the cold weather will allow you to fully submerge the body uh, into icy cold water, uh, it allows you to keep that body for an extra week or so prior to, uh, uh, prior to dissection. By the way, that's the same ice pond that they're using for ice provisions for dining. <laughs> okay, where are they getting the bodies? Where are they getting bodies? Um, they're getting bodies from Richmond. And so a body of letters, uh, a collection of letters has surfaced over the last uh, five years that allows us to better understand uh, the uh, taking of cadavers. And this is, uh, this is would eventually become MCV, but here you can see the, a scene in a dissecting room. This was uh, from the 1850s, um, sorry, 18, this is represented in the 1890s, but it's from an earlier period uh, when a body is spilling out of a barrel. And so there is a, um, uh, an underground and illegal market that's happening in Richmond, uh, 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 perpetuated by individuals who call themselves resurrectionists. This is Professor Davis. Professor Davis is the professor of dissection and anatomy at the University of Virginia, um, uh, where, he, uh, where he works for uh, a number of years. And, um, and he says, he, the so this is a letter to the resurrectionist from an intermediary, sorry, to uh, Professor Davis from the intermediary. The resurrectionist says the warm weather having been, sorry, the weather having been so warm here that the subjects are all in insipid putrefaction, or putrefaction, which I'm not sure is a word, when buried. I have reconnoitered the grounds myself, and the only colored burial I've noticed, the coffin was already sprung from the decomposition. Two important points to take away from here. The first is season. There's enough dissection that's happening at the University of Virginia, as well as the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, that it's running all the way through uh, the academic year, right? So they're not just limiting dissections to winter. They're, they're running dissections all the way through the year. What's the second obvious uh, uh, takeaway from this particular quote? Colored. All of the cadavers are African American. And this is, for us, the sort of perplexing, uh, uh, deeply disturbing irony. And that is, uh, the faculty members who are uh, advocating for uh, personal dissection, and uh, Davis here no longer wants faculty members themselves only to do dissections. He requires that every single one of his students actually perform a full body human cadaver dissection before graduation. Uh, practice makes perfect. 
right? And so that means that the University of Virginia, one estimate, one historian has estimated that we're consuming 25 to 30 cadavers a year um, and having those imported from Richmond on the train, illegally, by the way. Um, but that taps into uh, my concluding observation, and that is the choice to, to um, uh, enact a full-body dissection on an African-American cadaver is itself an, uh, its own p painful irony because of the ideological conversation that is simultaneously happening. Thomas Jefferson, when he writes in the notes on the state of Virginia, uh, offers a really disturbing and deeply offensive representation of African Americans, and he's writing this for a Parisian audience. I won't read it because it's so offensive, uh, but here it is for you for your observation. But what's important about this is that Thomas Jefferson is stepping into a current debate in the late 18th century about the origins of the species. Are African Americans and white Europeans actually part of the same species? This is a live and a hot question that's happening in the, in the late 18th and into the early 19th century that would eventually result in uh, uh, would be resolved in the publication, of course, by Darwin of the origin of the species uh, a number of decades later. But Jefferson here is participating in this question, are African Americans actually humans? Are they part of the same species uh, as, uh, as, a, as white Americans are? Uh, James Lawrence Cabell, who would graduate from the University of Virginia in 1833, would, t would teach medical theory. So if Davis is uh, educating um, uh, medical students in the dissection, uh, he's the uh, professor of dissection. Cavill is the theoretical, uh, um, he's, he's teaching uh, medical theory. And he perpetuates scientific hereditarianism. This notion that in fact uh, African Americans and white, uh, white, Amer and white European derived Americans are themselves in fact actually the same species, but because of the environmental determinism of Africa versus Europe, it generates into two different particular strains. And it's important here, acquired particularities produce different varieties. And so, in fact, there are two varietals of one singular species. Uh, blacks and whites are, in that way, uh, the same species, but the races themselves have a particular differentiation. This, of course, would lead, uh, in, and uh, Cabell is the chairman of the faculty. He's the most important faculty member at the University of Virginia in the 19th century, as Paul Berenger, his uh, protege, would then also become the chairman of the faculty. Uh, Paul Berenger publishes in 1900 an equally offensive narration on the history of the Negro, uh, reinforcing this particular differentiation between whites and Negroes. Um, and the irony here, of course, is that uh, uh, white faculty and white students are dissecting ex almost exclusively African Americans, not, not acknowledging the theoretical and th uh, the ideological distinction uh, of debate between these, uh, these two strains. Berenger, of course, would be a principal advocate for eugenics. Uh, eugenics would be the theoretical distinction uh, within the races that would ultimately lead to uh, supporting the policies of Nazi Germany and apartheid South Africa. Cabell and Berenger are critical advocates of that same um, uh, theoretical uh, distinction, race-based, uh, false race-based uh, science uh, that would perpetuate uh, some really, really disturbing policies passed in the state of Virginia in the 1920s, uh, the Virginia Racial Integrity Act and the Virginia Eugenical Sterilization Act, which would actually result in the sterilization through the middle of the 20th century of 7,000 Virginians thought to be uh, unworthy of um, uh, continuing their line through reproduction. Uh, and it's important for us at the University of Virginia to take a moment to uh, assess the way that this particular inherited trajectory actually informs our own racial biases today. A study in 2016 uh, suggests that uh, even here at the University of Virginia and at other, uh, at other institutions, racial bias, implicit bias, still plays a role in the differentiation and distribution of unequal medical care, uh, informed by uh, notions that African Americans pain, uh, feel pain at lower rates than do white Americans, and that African Americans have thicker skin composition. Both of those, of course, are false. Um, uh, differentiation. And so when we're thinking about the academical village and the collision of bodies and buildings, it's important that we differentiate the distinction between real bodies and ideal bodies and the uh, profound uh, implications that has for the way we educate today. Thank you. <laughs>